Southern writer Flannery O'Connor once wrote that the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. The fact that I personally may object to the truth doesn't matter, for the truth is the truth, even if I doubt it or deny it or even if I rail against it. Now, this isn't a popular position to take these days on a number of topics and subjects. Many people think that if 51% of the people um, believe in something, then it must be true. Or if the media says it's true, then it must be true. Speaking for postmodernists everywhere, Pontius Pilate asked Jesus a question that echoes down the centuries. What? is truth. Pilate, of course, didn't realize that the truth was standing right in front of him. Jesus himself had earlier declared, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. By those words, our Lord indicated that truth is more than a series of pronouncements, propositions to be studied and memorized. Truth is exceedingly personal. If you want to know the ultimate truth about life and death and the way to the Father, you need to know Jesus Christ. To know Him is to know the truth. And if you miss Him, you've missed the ultimate truth of the universe. Jesus also said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I was with one of a young men from our congregation the other day. He was helping me out with a, uh, a task at my home. And we were talking about some of the stuff going on in his life and some of the things he's faced. And I said, you know, in the Bible, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But the, truth, but the real truth is that a lot of times we will know the truth and the truth will tick you off. You know, we don't like to hear the truth, especially about ourselves. It is truth that sets us free, though not our opinions about the truth. You know, Pilate still has his friends today. What do you think? As for me, I'm going to do the best I can to stand with Jesus on this one. So let's take a look at this mysterious visit of the three kings. This brings me to our scripture today. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, tells of the mysterious story of the visit of of the Magi to King Herod in Jerusalem, and then to the baby Jesus in Bethlehem. We know all about the three wise men, don't we? Because we grew up singing that song, We Three Kings, from Orient R. And we've been to many Christmas pageants, haven't we? There's shepherds there, and the baby Jesus in the middle, and little angels all around, and then come in three nervous boys dressed in bathrobes, adorned with uh, shiny things, bringing gold and two other gifts they can't pronounce. And they're usually wearing funny-looking hats so that we don't confuse them with the shepherds. We know they found Jesus in the stable because that's the way it is in every Christmas pageant. Of course, mostly, most of this is, is tradition. The Bible says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now, there's no mention of the number of wise men. Did you notice that? By the way, don't look in uh, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find anything about three wise men. It's only in Matthew. Only in 12 verses. Doesn't mention how many. It just says magi came from the east, wise men from the east. Maybe we think in terms of three because of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Have you ever seen that Far Side cartoon? You know the cartoon strip Far Side? Maybe some of you have heard of it. Well, there's this one cartoon where, where there's a fourth magi there, and he gets turned away at the stable because the gift he brought was fruitcake. Matthew chapter 2 makes it clear that the Magi found Jesus in a house in Bethlehem. Did you catch that? In a house, not in a stable. 
So we can assume that they arrived some time after the birth of Jesus. Could have been a few days after some of the crowds have cleared away and now there was room at the inn or in a house, or it could have been several weeks. It could have been even a year later. All that we know about the visit of the Magi is found in chapter 2 of Matthew's Gospel. They show up in verse 1 and they disappear in verse 12. There's very few details about them. And so, so over the years, legends grew up about them. But the main purpose of this passage of Scripture is not to tantalize us with details about three wise men from the East. Rather, it's all about truth. It brings us face to face with how people respond when confronted with the truth of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at this. Some people seek the truth. Here's what we know about the wise men. The term magi is a Persian word which referred to a special class of priests in the Persian Empire. They were the professors and philosophers of their day, trained in medicine, history, religion, prophecy, and astronomy. Some of that astronomy we today call astrology. At that time, astrology was connected with man's search for God. The ancients studied the skies in order to find answers to life's greatest questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? The Magi were highly educated men who thought deeply about life and consequently, it's perfectly legitimate to call them wise men. But why did they travel so far from home? It was 1,000 miles from Persia to Israel. You see, they couldn't go straight west because there's a big desert there. They had to go north and then west and then south to get there. 1,000 miles and it was a treacherous journey. Why? Seekers of truth will go to great lengths to get the answers. We know that the Jews and the Persians had intermingled for almost 500 years prior to this. Since the time of Daniel, the Persians had known about the Jewish expectation of a Messiah. And remember, there were Jews living there in the east in Babylon and Persia since the time of their captivity 700 years before Jesus. So the seekers of truth have come to see for themselves if it is true that a baby born king of the Jews is there and they want to know what it meant. They knew that a baby had been born, but they didn't know where. And they knew he was a king, but, or assumed to be a king, but they didn't know his name. They knew the approximate time of his appearing. A new sign in the sky indicated that, but not the exact time. So, consider how little they knew. They had seen a star and they knew a baby called the King of the Jews had been born. Yet with nothing more than that, they left their home and embarked on a risky venture to find the baby, bring him gifts, and worship him. The Magi, you see, are, are not Jews. They're not believers. And yet they've, they've been drawn to Jesus. How interesting. Maybe, maybe it's a great example of faith. They didn't know very much about Jesus, but, but what they knew spurred them on to some action. So they came to Jerusalem, the capital city, seeking help. Now you'd assume that a new king of the Jews would be born in the capital city, right? So they assumed that everybody there would know where the baby was. But they soon discovered that not everyone shared their desire to find Jesus, or at least not in the way they desired to find him. For you see, some people fear the truth. Maybe you remember Jack Nicholson's iconic line in that movie, A Few Good Men. He's the Marine Colonel, and he says to the young Harvard Navy lawyer, you can't handle the truth. That's the reaction of King Herod. He fits that pattern. Matthew chapter 2, verse 3 says that when Herod heard the news, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. The word disturbed here 
the translation from the Bible, really means to shake violently. Herod was all shook up when he heard about this. Herod the Great, you see, was very old, very sick, very clever, and a cruel man. Like all despots, he held tightly to the reins of power and brutally removed anyone who got in his way. Above everything else that we know about Herod, we know him as a killer. He had already killed his mother-in-law. Okay, guys, I know some of what some of you are thinking. <laughs> Calm down here. He had killed his brother-in-law. And he had even killed his first wife. And after 41 years on the throne, Herod got word that his two sons were plotting to overthrow him. And so... Consistent with his character, he ordered them to be put to death by strangulation. No wonder the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, once said, it's safer to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. Other, other historians wrote about him, describing him as barbaric, disturbed, a malevolent maniac, and the great pervert. The Roman Senate had actually appointed Herod to be king of the Jews, but he wasn't even a Jew. And the Jewish people hated him and chafed under his brutal rule. So you can understand why the notion of a baby born among the Jews to be their king would sound like a threat to Herod. No wonder he tried to kill Jesus. In his eyes, it was kill or be killed. And now, in the twilight of his life, he was ready to kill anyone who threatened him, even a tiny, helpless baby. Now, why all this talk about Herod? It's because he stands as a symbol for the kind of world Jesus entered. He represents the world's welcoming committee for the Son of God. Not the way you thought it would be at the Christmas pageant, is it? Jesus is born, and the rulers want to kill him. The Bible says he came to what was his own, but his own did not receive him. Herod stands for the selfish and vindictive side of the world system, where personal advancement is placed above the life of others. Herod died, but his spirit lives on. To this day, there are those who are afraid of or offended by Jesus, even by the mere mention of his name. They oppose spiritual truth, and they want to erase every trace of Christmas from public life. Christians are persecuted with discrimination, prison, beatings, even death in many countries today. In fact, there is a religion out of the Middle East that actively seeks to stamp out faith in Christ. Even in our own country, there are those who fear the truth found in Jesus. Complaints and lawsuits regarding Christmas and Jesus being uttered at schools have become commonplace. The word Christmas is banished from retail outlets as though it's such a frightening thing, while manger scenes are removed from city halls across America. I just read a news item the other day about the student government of Tufts University voting to decertify a campus Christian group at that institution. Herod would be proud of them all. But there's a third group of people. Some people ignore the truth. Before Herod can get rid of the baby, he has to seem interested in helping these strange visitors find the Christ child so he can find him also. So he turns to the scribes and the priests for advice. He has only one question for them. Where is this child to be born? Now, Jerusalem at this time contained the finest 
collection of Bible scholars in the whole world. So when Herod asked, where is the Messiah to be born, they didn't really have to look it up. They already knew the answer. They didn't have to say, oh, hang on, king, uh, I need a lifeline. Can I call a friend here and get some help? You see, they were the friends that other people called when they had a Bible question. They knew the answer immediately. The prophet Micah had said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. End of story. Everyone in Israel knew this. Even little children learned it in Sabbath school before they were six years old. It's hard to believe that Herod didn't know it, but not being a Jew and spending his time plotting how to get rid of his family members, I guess, maybe he didn't have time to hear this one. If you add what the scribes knew to what the wise men figured out, you could surely conclude that the signs of Jesus' coming were clear enough for, for anyone to see. It's sometimes said that God always speaks loud enough for a willing ear to hear. He certainly did that in this case. Now, here's the telling observation. The Magi knew, and they did something. The scribes knew, and they didn't do anything. There is no report that the scribes ever went to Jerusalem, or, I'm, excuse me, to Bethlehem to check out what they knew. This fact is all the more shocking when you consider that the scribes were the professional students of the Torah, the part of the Bible we call the Old Testament. They knew every prophecy of the Messiah's coming by heart. Just goes to show that it's possible to know a great deal and still miss the truth. There they were, six miles from Jesus. Did you know that Bethlehem is only six miles from Jerusalem? Most people could walk it in a couple of hours. Today, Bethlehem is like a suburb of Jerusalem. Back then, people who lived in Bethlehem would often go to Jerusalem to do their shopping or to go to the temple. It's an easy journey on good roads, six miles. And yet, none of the scribes could be bothered to check out the rumor that the long-awaited Messiah had been born. Only six miles. Born to set thy people free. It was only six miles. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Just six miles. It was only six miles. You know, six miles isn't very far. You're right. You know, that's the distance from my house to this church. I can ride it on my bike in 45 minutes. The scribes were six miles from Jesus. Six miles from salvation. Six miles from forgiveness. Six miles from eternal life. You're right. Six miles, but... They were too busy to go see for themselves. How far are you from Jesus? Look at this. The Magi knew so little, yet they traveled so far. The scribes knew so much, yet wouldn't even venture six miles down the road. Who's worse, Herod? The one who wanted to destroy the truth or the scribes who ignored the truth. When I read Matthew chapter 2, I'm struck by the fact that everybody involved had the same basic information. They all knew that a baby had been born in Bethlehem and they all, they all know, knew who the baby was. Herod knew and he tried to kill him. The scribes knew and they ignored him. The wise men knew and they worshipped him. Jesus stands at the end of life's road for all of us. And in the end, there is no middle ground. To ignore him is the same as to hate him because you end up without him either way. 
Maybe hatred is more no noble than casual disinterest because when you hate, at least you pay attention to the object of your hatred. And, and that very attention may in some time lead to a change of heart. To ignore Jesus altogether means to live, live as if he doesn't matter at all. But no one can ignore him forever. We all have an appointment with Christ sooner or later. In just a little bit, you'll be invited to come up for communion. It's your opportunity to take a step, to reaffirm or to affirm for the first time that you seek Jesus as king of your life. So make every step count. Say it to him as you walk or when you come to the communion rail or if you kneel there to pray. And then go from here making a change in your life, something you haven't done before for him. Commit to doing something for him. What will you do with Jesus? Are you with Herod or are you with the scribes or are you with the wise men? Remember, some hate him, some ignore him, some seek him. What about you? You see, the ultimate question is not how other people respond, but how you respond to Jesus. Today, that's really the only thing that matters in your life. Amen.